Um, hi everyone, it's wonderful to have so many people here. Um, so today we have um, Sierra Jones speaking for us. Um, the title of the presentation is Re-envisioning the Classics Through African Diasporic Art, Alison Saar. So Sierra Jones is a PhD student in the Interdepartmental Program of Ancient History at the University of Michigan. She began learning Latin as a high school freshman and was immediately captivated by the language and by Roman history. She continued studying the classics at, Wayne, at the Wayne State University of Detroit, where she was able to further explore her interest in black classicism and extend the reach of classical studies by helping to reestablish the university's classics club. She also received a master's degree from the Bridge MA program at the university in 2020. She's interested in research on astrological knowledge in the Roman Empire and classical reception of African diasporic people. Um, yep, yeah, Sierra, over to you. I'm muted. Okay, I am now unmuted. Okay, so thank you uh, so much uh, to the Christian Cole Society for putting on this uh, wonderful uh, Classics Reconnected series. Uh, I am just so grateful to, to be here and to talk to you all. Um, and I'm excited to share. So let me share my screen. All right. Um, can you all see my screen? Oh, wait. Yep, that's perfect. Okay, okay. Thank you. All right, um, so um, I'm excited to share with you all a part of a research project I'm developing on um, visual representations of Classica Africana um, and which are paintings, statues, murals and other artworks created by artists of African descent that engage with the myth and aesthetics um, of ancient Greeks and Romans. Uh, so far for this project, I've focused on locating the works of African American sculptors and redefining uh, how these artists transform the classics to communicate um, their personal message um, to a broader audience. And I look forward to hearing uh, your comments, questions, and feedback at the end of this presentation. Um, so a brief overview of today's talk. First, we will look at the artist Alison Saar, her background, her inspirations to get a better understanding of how elements from the classical and the various African diaspora communities converge in her artwork. Next, uh, we will look at one of her earlier works entitled Dying Slave, which re-envisions um, the figure of Michelangelo's sculpture by the same name as an enslaved African in the Americas using mythological and ritual imagery borrowed from the different culture groups of Central Africa, which now makes up the Democratic Republic of the Congo. To end, we will turn to one of Sars' um, more modern public installations entitled Feeling and Follow, um, that retells the Persephone myth uh, through the four seasons and also the life cycle of Black women in America. Oh. <laughs> Alison Saar is an American um, sculptor, printmaker, mixed media, and installation artist from a family of artists. Her mother, Betty Saar, is an LA based artist of African, Native American, and European ancestry. Betty's are concerned itself with the different spiritualist traditions of diaspora communities in the Americas, Black feminism, and often comments on national and international events involving marginalized people. Visual elements from African derived religions, such as Santeria altars and the talismans and god figures of Hoodoo spiritualism, are used by both mother and daughter. Betty's consistent stress on materiality and the creation process lends layers of narrative complexity to her artwork, which was another early inspiration uh, for Allison's own artistic approach um, later on when she developed her own career. Uh, Betty, who is still an active artist at 94 years old, collects the materials for her artwork by scavenging flea markets and yard sales for the cultural artifacts of the people, um, which are campy knickknacks, jewelry that's been passed down through multiple generations, handwoven handkerchiefs, even discarded old uh, photos. Um, and as an example of her work, uh, here's a photo of her installation uh, titled The Liberation of Aunt Jemima. So uh, the composition of the installation itself is reminiscent of Santeria altars um, with the main figure um, in the middle surrounded by iconography that is associated with them. So we have 
Aunt Jemima um, in the front and she's holding a picture of a lighter skinned Aunt Jemima, um, a character of herself, um, who is holding um, a child of um, mixed and um, ethnicity um, when we don't really know uh, what, but um, the point is that he is somewhere um, in this hierarchy between um, white and black. And in the back we have, um, I guess like a more modern um, representation of Aunt Jemima that tries to go, tries to walk back on a lot of her racialized um, character features. Um, and Santeria altars are, um, are from, originate from Afro-Cuban spiritualism um, religions. Um, and they are altars built uh, to honor the familial deceased or in Betty Starr's case, um, to honor Aunt Jemima, who is seen as a spiritual ancestor um, to her in the Black community, um, even if she is not real. Uh, and um, these altars incorporate ritual and visual elements from Judaism, Roman Catholicism, and Yoruba religions. Um, Aunt Jemima, the Aunt Jemima figurine and the postcard of herself um, are yard cell finds um, that Betty Sard has combined um, in this installation to challenge the narrative um, of Aunt Jemima that has been put forth um, in the United States. So um, the way she challenges this uh, narrative is she has sculpted uh, for her figure a shotgun in her left hand. Um, as you can see here, that was not um, originally a part of um, Aunt Jemima's iconography. Um, and tucked under her right arm, um, she has a hand grenade. Um, and um, so by holding um, a light-skinned version of her caricature, this Aunt Jemima um, disrupts all racialized depictions of herself um, as a docile mammy, maid, houseworker, um, child caretaker, and she embraces um, the fullness of her blackness. Her father, Richard Saar, uh, who was an LA-based art conservator uh, who worked on the Syrian Friezes collection held at the LA County Art Museum. Richard was classically trained at the Cleveland Art High School in Ohio and continued uh, his studies of art conservatorship and ceramics during his apprenticeship at the Cleveland Museum of Art. According to Allison, she found figurative inspiration for her artwork in the early pre-classical and classical images Richard often worked with. So while on her mom's um, side, we have uh, these artistic traditions at play. Um, and um, here's a quote from Allison about the duality of the artistic influence um, from both of her parents. Um, in her interview, she often speaks of a blended household where um, all arts um, from diff all uh, art traditions were treated at the same level. One was not above the other and um, all types of art creation from printmaking to um, sculpture making to working with um, acids um, was encouraged by in her um, by both of her parents. Um, Allison has said that her father's work with ceramics and art conservation are represented in her work in the physical aspects while the visual aesthetic elements are inspired by her mother's combining of different materials and um, combining their embedded histories to tell new stories. Uh, by watching her parents at work, Allison was able to gain familiarity with certain cultural, historical, um, and technical aspects of the art world. And, the and this intimate knowledge, uh, coupled with her desire to produce something in her own artistic voice, motivated her to attend um, school, art school. Um, in 1978, uh, Allison graduated from Scripps College with dual degrees in studio art and art history. And in 1981, she received a master's um, in fine arts from the Otis College of Art and Design. The sculptures and prints featured in her graduate showcase emphasize and harmonize the seemingly dissonant aspects of her ethnic and cultural heritage. Um, that converged to create her unique identity as a Black woman of mixed ethnic background living in the United States. Um, the first piece created for her show, um, entitled Si Jeta Blanc, 
uh, shares a name with uh, the 1932 song by musician and activist Josephine Baker and expresses similar sentiments about being Black in societies hostile to Blackness. Both song and sculpture reflect on the paradox experienced by Black people in which the desire to escape racial, racial prejudice um, and persecution leads one to wish for whiteness, um, but this wish is ultimately empty uh, because to become white would mean to change uh, the superficial shell at the expense of losing your eternal connected um, rooted identity. And here is the sculpture, um, Si Jeta Blanc. Um, the figure here is a painted wood carving whose chest and legs um, have broken glass embedded in them. Uh, the figure sits and contemplates, uh, while the figure sits and contemplates what life would be like um, if they were white, if they had white skin, if their hair wasn't so coarse, if they didn't have the, um, the facial features that mark them as inferior in um, their world that they live in. Um, the essence which connects them uh, to their pre-colonial African heritage shatters um, inside of their chest cavity. And this uh, disruption of the cell continues um, through the legs and then damages the entire support system. Inside the figure's chest cavity is a literal uh, mirror into their soul, which we can see is filled with shattered glass shards um, all in there. Um, and this iconography is borrowed from the Minkisi Minkandu statues um, utilized in Congolese medicine and magic rituals. Um, and Kisi Mankandi are power figures used to both curse a target and avert the effects of hexes brought on by malicious magic and evil spirits. Um, although Sar uses broken glass in this piece, an activated Nkisi and Kandi figure would have several nails hammered into it instead. Um, as we will see later in the presentation, Sar will return to this powerful cultural imagery um, for many of her other sculptures and installations. Uh, and here is a picture of um, an Nkisi Nkandi um, in the singular. It's a power figure, uh, um, like I said, for um, rituals. And in the center cavity is where um, the activator would put um, herbs and ashes, um, bones, cloths, um, whatever is required uh, for that particular um, ritual for that specific situation. We don't know when this was created or who created it, but we do know that it was acquired by Yale University in 2004. By the time Sar graduated, her signature style established through her borrowing from the artistic archives of European, African and African diaspora traditions had already been solidified. In 1989, Sar debuted the sculpture, Dying Slave, recasting Michelangelo's 1513 figure as an enslaved African in the Americas. Um, for, for historical context on their original work, um, Michelangelo was commissioned by uh, Pope Julius II, um, known then as now as the warrior Pope for his constant campaigns against the French. Um, and the year in the century previous, uh, between France and Italy, there were three popes one of them was Pope Julius's uncle. So he and um, they were of an Italian um, papal family. So he really had it in him to restore Italian hegemony to the area. Um, so at this time, uh, Pope Julius II um, had commissioned Michelangelo uh, to design this huge extravagant, extravagant tomb, um, build it and then create 43 uh, life-size marble statues um, that would stand and um, adorn the outside and lead to the inside of the chamber where his body would be held. The tomb of Julius, as it was called, um, underwent several revisions and was not completed until several years after his death. Um, in the end, uh, Michelangelo was only able to finish two statues, uh, the dying slave and the rebellious slave. Uh, since he was also asked by Pope Julius II uh, to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. So 
And here is a picture of the dying slave. Um, the dying slave um, and, and its companion piece, the rebellious slave, are now exhibited um, in the Michelangelo Gallery of the Louvre Museum. If uh, you are interested in um, seeing this uh, piece in person, and I have not, but I've heard that it's um, incredible because uh, these two pieces are larger than life, um, standing at about uh, seven feet tall. Um, and exactly what was intended for these sculptures theme-wise and how they would have related to the overall concept of uh, the Pope's tomb is unknown because of the constant revisions and both statues were ultimately scrapped from the final monument um, and they uh, differ um, from those, the statues that were included. Um, visually, we can see uh, features distinct to Michelangelo, uh, such as the use of contrapposto uh, to add a sense of dynamic movement um, and um, extreme attention to the taco details of the human flesh. I mean, you can leave it to Michelangelo to like really sculpt uh, a realistic uh, vision of what a human body looks like. I mean, you can see all the muscles, you can see the skin folds. You look at his face um, here on the right. Um, there's so much detail um, in the in his face and his lips and hair. Um, it's very um, idiosyncratic of Michelangelo's uh, style to take cold marble and to make it come to life in a figure. Um, but this figure is um, not alive, or at least on um, the edge of dying. Um, and he is a young boy uh, posed in the moment of death, uh, but you really wouldn't get this uh, um, and this image of dying unless I had told you um, that the, the title was called Dying Slave. He doesn't really appear to be dying, um, even though his weight is shifted. Um, his body is really stiff. His eyes and face are serene. Um, and he looks a little too ecstatic um, in his death to be a true depiction of uh, dying in bondage. Dying in bondage, and is most likely um, Michelangelo's own romanticized um, vision of what that might look like. Um, and here we have the rebellious slave. Um, it's companion piece on the left, uh, and it is very different um, in composition and I think thematically from Dying Slave, whereas um, Dying Slave seems to almost acquiesce to uh, um, a peaceful death and bondage, uh, and bondage. We have the rebellious slave here um, in a more dynamic contrapostal position, um, struggling against his fetters, um, and looking up to the heavens for divine intervention. A uh, SAR sculpture, um, the response, uh, shares similar posing with Michelangelo's figure. Both hold their arms in similar positions and are shifting their weight unevenly between their feet. Uh, but SARS is of an entirely different material composition um, the core of the figure is a wooden carving painted red and covered in ceiling tin, giving the exterior a rough, uneven texture. Uh, not just an aesthetic choice, the roughness uh, of the pressed tin uh, speaks to the harsh realities the figure endured at the hands of his masters um, under the chattel slavery system. Um, and there's even scratches made um, in the figure's chest and abdomen and thighs going all the way down. Um, and I couldn't find an image of the figure's backside, uh, though it bears, I think, the most um, damning evidence of um, his inhumane uh, treatment um, based on what Alison Sarr has um, said about the messaging behind this uh, figure, um, because the back bears deep, ragged, um, ragged gouges um, made in the tin using a can opener to expose the red paint underneath. Um, so it's supposed to be a uh, recalling of um, the many whippings and beatings um, Af enslaved Africans endured um, in the Americas. Unlike Michelangelo's slave, this figure is chained by iron shackles. 
The abdomen contains a window into the figure's core through which we can see that at his core are the remnants of his connection to his ancestral religion and home in Central Africa. Though his body remains forever trapped in the context of slavery, his soul, his inner being becomes free of his wretched condition. This piece has earned Saar acclaim throughout the artistic world, especially among Afrocentric communities for its raw expression and tackling difficult narratives of slavery in the Americas at a time where um, the art community was moving away uh, from such expressions and into more um, cleaner narratives, I should say. Um, art reviewers are keen to acknowledge uh, Sars borrowing of the visual elements um, from the classical art tradition. However, uh, there has been less acknowledgement of Sars' engagement in the centuries-long debate concerning the role of the classics in shaping what is called Western civilization. Uh, through Dying Slave, Sar disrupts the classical tradition, um, Big C and Little C, in uh, two ways. One, um, the figure's spiritual resistance, um, holding on to his native religion at the very core of his body, even in death, um, uh, rebukes his corporal condition um, and the restraining efforts uh, made by his um, captors in the Americas. Um, he may die here, but he will always hold on to his identity, um, which cannot be shackled, uh, such as the body can. Um, and two, Sars' um, insertion of African diasporic narratives and iconography into the Western art tradition opposes uh, the trend of dismissing non-European art uh, traditions in the global art community. Um, the concept of European hegemony um, in all aspects uh, held by um, the old masters of the Renaissance in terms of art and culture and um, the later masters of the transatlantic slave trade um, in terms of humanity and value of human life are rooted in the appropriation of the philosophical, literary, artistic, and other traditional or other uh, cultural traditions of the Greeks and Romans. So uh, while Dying Slave engages with classical thought and theories and practice, next we will look at um, how, uh, the next work we will look at um, <laughs> engages with classical mythologies and narrative structures. Um, in 2011, Alison Saar was commissioned by uh, the Madison Square Park um, Conservation uh, to create a multi-sculpture installation um, as part of the conservatory's program of showcasing the works of different artists uh, to the New York City public. For this project, she combined two sculptures uh, from a previous installation and four new creations, which depict the cycle um, of the four seasons through uh, the Persephone myth. Although addressed to Demeter, the second Homeric hymn contains the foundation myth for Persephone and also provides a mythical explanation for seasonal change on earth. Uh, the hymn tells of Persephone's abduction at the hands of Hades, her time spent in the underworld and Demeter's meanwhile search for her daughter. In the end, uh, Demeter is reunited with her daughter, uh, but with the caveat that Persephone must return to the underworld for one third of the year, every year. Sar's cohesive work um, entitled Feelin' and Follow, uh, 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 the Sar's, I'm sorry, Sar's cohesive work is entitled Feelin' and Follow, and the title itself plays with the allegorical themes surrounding race, femininity, and agriculture. Um, in this context, Feelin' brings to mind um, imagery of seasonal harvests, trees shedding their leaves, and the overall decline of the year as um, we approach the winter season. Starting with spring, the four seasons are personified as black women at different stages of their lives. The adjective follow recalls imagery of fields picked bare of their colorful produce, leaving behind yellow barren tracts of land. For the figures of SARS installation, the rela their relationship with the color imagery that the, world, that the word follow evokes is tenuous because it also recalls uh, to mind 
their position in the colorism hierarchy uh, that further defines the trajectory of their lives and the lives of other melanated people. So here are um, the original tree souls in Madison Park. And these two uh, belong to an original installation entitled The Woods Within, uh, which SAR created for the Brooklyn Museum's um, um, atria, um, atrium um, in 1994. Um, just like with uh, Dying Slave, we have this uh, ceiling tin that gives a rough texture uh, to the outside. And it also um, does this cool thing that it rusts. Uh, so it also uh, changes color um, as it is affected um, by nature and the things around it. Um, when Sar was inspired uh, for this piece um, by elements from African Caribbean uh, mythology, which tell of people emerging um, from the earth. And uh, the figures here are literally rolled, rooted to their heritage through their feet. So um, at the bottom, you can see that they don't have feet. They're actually just replaced by roots and um, they emerge from the earth um, by their feet and they can still return to the earth because they are connected. Um, they are literally rooted to the ground. So uh, the first statue or the first uh, statue in this um, cyclical series of the year um, is spring, um, which depicts a girl sitting in a tree with her head bowed um, and her hair is flowing over, um, over for her, excuse me. Um, Sar continues the root motif here uh, in her hair, this time not in her feet, uh, which calls to mind for um, Black women in particular, this uh, relationship with the hair and how in ways you are rooted to your hair, um, no matter what you do, uh, no matter how it looks, it defines you, it gives you away, it connects you. Um, and it also, um, because it's holding um, these cocoons and chrysalis and, and moths, um, it symbolizes uh, the birth and life of spring. But for a Black woman, um, it, it also calls to mind this, the negative stereotype of um, hair being a trap for dirt and debris and all sorts of things um, because of its uh, texture and perceived um, unruliness. Um, so the young girl is sitting here. She is not in her prime. Um, she is enjoying what it is like to sit in a tree and have your hair down. In the summer, uh, we have a matured woman who is more assimilated into society. And uh, we can see that by her tamed, pressed hair um, and her dress. She's now uh, clothed and uh, she is pregnant. Um, the mirror in the center of her, uh, her abdomen is supposed to signify um, that pregnancy. Um, um, just like with the, the belly mirrors we've seen in C. Jeté Blanc and Dying Slave, uh, the mirror here gives a glimpse into the woman's connection to her ancestral uh, religion, the Yoruba religion. Um, as fireflies um, are associated with new life and um, new expression. Um, um, by the fall, the woman has reclaimed some of her, uh, her original identity, um, though the vestiges of her assimilation still remain in her dress, and but she's using it um, to her advantage. She's trying to catch um, the fruits um, that are falling um, from her head. So um, those fruits are, are pomegranates. <laughs> um, and they are, they in the fall, they have um, ripened and they are now falling from their roots, um, bursting open and um, letting go all of their um, vitality. and. Um, this woman is seeing that in herself and she's trying to, to capture that um, vitality in her dress. Um, and the, the pomegranate um, 
carries a uh, complex uh, um, imagery, especially for Persephone, um, because it was the fruit uh, that um, is symbolic of her treachery that was used to trap her in the underworld. Um, though some readings of the myth um, interpret the pomegranate's uh, symbolism to represent Persephone's transition from adolescence to adulthood and queenship. So instead of seeing it as um, this negative thing that um, brings up, that calls to mind her separation from her mother Demeter um, and the sadness and the death that is, um, the earth is experiencing. Um, for Persephone um, personally, this pomegranate represents um, her um, leaving behind um, childhood and becoming and, and transforming and becoming an entirely um, new deity, the queen of the underworld. Um, and there is a tradition among Black women, artists and authors, um, of dissecting and transforming the structures um, and themes of classical myth, in particular the Persephone myth. Um, as Tracy Walters notes in her book, uh, African American Literature and the Classicist Tradition, writers such as Toni Morrison, Gwendolyn Brooks, Rita Dove, and Alice Walker have adapted this, an this ancient story to fit the framework of contemporary experience um, and the coming of age of Black girls in America. For African American writers in particular, Persephone. Uh, the Persephone figure serves as an archetype for Black women who, by virtue of their race and gender, see themselves as double minorities oppressed, oppressed by patriarchy. Uh, for Sars' figure, uh, the falling pomegranates and her attempts to catch them combine uh, with the seasonal theme to suggest a futility in her efforts. Um, time for her has marched on, and it will march on for all of us, um, and the fruits of our lives will ripen, decay, and fall with time. Finally, we have winter, represented as a figure curled um, into a ball on the ground. <laughs> so very poignant, poignant um, as well. Um, uh, the pose hints at death and ruin. Um, which is in line with the seasonal theme, but there's also this sense of hope because Sar has injected into um, uh, the, the Persephone myth that um, this, uh, sorry, uh, these uh, themes from um, the Yoruba um, religion, which talk of life and rebirth, um, which we saw in summer. Um, so there's a sense of hope Winter cannot last forever, and um, on the classical myth side, uh, Persephone will return um, to the earth, um, and spring will come again. Um, and for the Black women in this installation, um, there is hope in the next generation of um, Black girls um, as they come into spring. Um, Allison has said, uh, throughout her career that her primary interest um, in creating art is to bridge together communities through mutual understanding of shared human experiences, struggle, loss, death, and rebirth. Um, because we all um, have a share in the human experience, we all can relate in some way to these artworks and to the ideals, traditions, and aesthetics they promote. Uh, to conclude, I would like um, to leave you all with a quote from Alison Saar about the accessibility of her art. I really felt that there are others out there who wanted to be able to connect with work and these ideas that are sometimes beyond their experience or more often than not within their experience. I think the work really deals with this universal experience. That's what interests me. So if it was about this universal, this universal experience of these basic things in our lives, what we feel, what we need, and what we desire, and it should be able to speak universally to different people in different languages. Thank you. And I look forward to hearing your questions and comments. Thanks, Sierra, for that presentation. Um, it was really good, like both halves, um, the way that you engage with like Michelangelo and like the Renaissance at the beginning, and then sort of very um, like Greek mythology in the Persephone. Um, so yeah, like I said in the chat, um, any questions for Sierra, 
or any thoughts or any um, comments. Um, there's some well-deserved praise already. I guess one question I had um, was with regard to um, the sculptures with the combined um, hair with roots. Um, yes. You mentioned the sort of the negative connotations that um, black women have with regards to like it trapping dirt and that sort of thing. I was wondering yes. whether um, you also thought because of the imagery of roots it might have something, or it could be interpreted as something actually also to do with life because roots are so, um, like an image of like, like vitality as well. And I think that reading, that reading um, of this is fitting because it, it fits into the theme of life. I mean, this is um, spring. So uh, through her, her hair is her life. She's, she's rooted to it. Um, um, and even if in um, summer her hair is pressed, it's still, will return and give her her roots back. So yeah, um, hair rooted in life. <laughs> um, so Clara has a question. Um, you can either ask yourself or I can read it out for you. Okay, um, so Clara says, have you been in touch with Alison Saar? How do you balance your own interpretation against the artist? This is something that uh, they're trying to figure out in their own work. So I have not been in contact with Alison Saar. Uh, this is a very um, new versioning um, project and I would, I would really like to um, reach out to her someday and get her opinions on this. Um, but I believe um, between balancing my interpretation versus uh, the artist's interpretation um, I would like to stay as close to her interpretation as possible, um, even though we are uh, Black women, um, both Black women, I recognize that she and I have different um, experiences. Um, and I, I really tried for this uh, project to, to find um, our interviews and articles where she talks about um, her own experience, um, because she, it really does come out in her work and she, um, she comments often um, that her work is supposed to not only um, connect to different people, but it's supposed to connect her to other people. So uh, uh, for me, um, the way I was I able to balance this um, was to, to see who the artist was and what she was trying to interpret. And then um, I guess uh, not to, to put my, um, my classicist uh, um, training over her um, explanation of her experience. Um, another question from Kathleen Quinn. Um, would you like to ask it yourself or? Uh... Sure, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, I just wondered, I, I was unfamiliar with this piece, um, the Feeling and Fallow, and I just wondered, um, in the actual installation, how close together are the seasons, um, these statues of the four seasons? Uh, would, is it something that you would see all at once? Is it something that you have to kind of walk through the park to experience? Um, and how do you see that sort of um, adding to the interpretation? Thank you. Um, so uh, the way that these sculptures were um, placed in the park, they were all spread out. So um, in order to um, get the full image, you had to walk the, um, around the park. There's, I think there's a, um, a circular track. Um, I, I, I'm not entirely sure, but you have to walk in the, through the entire park to see it. So you have to um, see other um, pieces of art in the park. You have to see um, other like benches. You have to see other trees. You have to see other people. Um, so it's trying to connect you, uh, the, the um, art conservatory uh, program with uh, Madison Park, it was trying to get people, is continuously trying to get people to 
um, engage more with the scenery around them um, and the artwork does that. Um, and I believe that each um, individual um, Insta or a sculpture in the installation has a plaque that uh, tells you, or there's a, um, and there's also a, a main plaque that uh, tells of the story. Um, but this is not in um, the park anymore. It was there in 2011. And I think uh, with the parks programs, uh, they cycle uh, through um, artists and their installations every six months. Um, but Allison has said something about, um, um, installation called Foison and Follow, uh, which tells more of the Demeter side of this um, story. Um, I think um, Dora has had the hand up for a while. Um, do you want to ask you, or you can ask a question? Sure, thanks, Ray. Um, Sarah, this is amazing. It's Really, it's really great to see you, first of all, but also like I loved your presentation. Thank you so much for sharing all this with us. Um, I came a little bit late, so I'm sorry if you already talked about this, but um, I was just curious as to like how you discovered Alison Saar um, and also like which one of her works is your personal favorite and like speaks to you the most as someone who's kind of like, I think I really appreciated your response about not wanting to like override her intentionality and experience. Hello. Like, um, I'm going to sign those letters there. Oh, good, good. And what else? And then uh, I'll pack up the boxes and get those going. Uh, but uh, I already switched out the ink in Ted's fax machine. So that's already done. Vanessa? Uh, yeah, so I just have to wrap those up. And then I think I should be good. Yeah. Um, Vanessa. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, when we Okay, um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna try to yeah, talk go, over. Go it. <laughs> I, <laughs> um, but, um, oh, it sounds good. The, the way I got to um, Alison Saar was um, actually through another African-American um, sculptor, Edmonia, um, Edmonia Mary Lewis, um, who was active um, in the 1800s. And I was working on, um, she, Edmonia Lewis was a classicist. Um, and I was looking at her artwork and how she took um, um, art from um, European uh, traditions um, and, and changed them for her own um, messaging. And at that time, um, uh, Black people were using the classics not uh, um, to uh, promote their own humanity that had already been done um, some centuries prior or some centuries prior um, by uh, poets such as like, um, uh, sorry, uh, Phyllis Wheatley, but she was doing this more to um, insert herself um, into this artistic tradition that Black people had been um, excluded from. Uh, so I saw there were similarities with that in Alison Saar. Now, how exactly I got to Alison Saar, I am not, <laughs> I really do not remember, uh, <laughs> which is unfortunate. Um, but uh, it, it falls in line with this project. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of um, our archival work that um, it is really hard to find um, work that's not explicitly labeled um, for classics um, if it involves more, um, um, uh, I guess, like art traditions or more um, Lally traditions that are not um, classics. So uh, even though um, her, her art clearly um, incorporates uh, these ideas, um, it was just really difficult to find. Um, so uh, my favorite uh, is not actually in um, this presentation uh, and it's, but it's called Afro Deity and it's based on um, the idea of um, heroic figures um, in a Greco-Roman myth. And, it, and it's, it was um, inspired by um, Allison looking at the um, at a Hercules figure um, in a museum, I forgot which museum, but she saw the statue of Hercules, and he had um, a head of a lion in one hand and like a club in the other, and um, she's uh, acutely aware um, and engages with the um, classics, and she she had this background, but she was curious as to why. Um, there's always one, a male figure, and two, they're always depicted in violence or conquering. Um, so for Afro deity, she has um, um, a woman, and again, we have like this hair motif, <laughs> um, 
but her hair is being pulled in all directions and different buckets that are supposed to represent different um, aspects of life. Um, at the center of that uh, fixture, um, um, sculpture is also um, like the window mirror uh, motif that she continues um, with. So it's supposed to be a reflection um, of like the black feminine self. Um, so that's, that's my favorite. Uh, I'm not sure if I answered your first question. I really don't remember how I got to Alice and Star, but I'm so glad that I found this work um, because it shows that there are um, classics, there are classicists outside of classics that um, we can look at um, whose work um, is important. Oh, thank you. Um, I think um, Holly has the hand up. Yes, uh, uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, how how you, how you guys doing? We uh, listened to your talk, outstanding work. We were very appreciative of the information. What I'd like to ask is, as somebody who works with, with people who are really into classics and definitely not into this type of classics, they are pretty much non-Afrocentric in, in thought. How do I get them to see what you're saying? How, do, how would I present this? Because when you're when you're trying to get expand somebody's horizons and get them to see different cultures, sometimes they're a little not receptive. Yes. How would I start? Um, that is, I think, <laughs> very difficult, and uh, I might have to ask uh, pull from the audience for some help. But I uh, believe that it, it is difficult one because it's so rooted in the way we perceive our world now. Um, we think of our world um, in um, rational and logical and empirical terms. And um, we believe uh, that this is the way that the world should be and has always been measured in these terms. But um, this way of thinking um, actually comes uh, post-Renaissance and the Enlightenment era. So it's a very new way of thinking. It's a very European, European way of viewing the world um, in the grand scheme of um, world history. Um, and the first step, I think, um, would be to somehow get um, the, I guess, these Eurocentric um, thought patterns um, to understand that there are uh, more epistemologies, there are more ways, um, there are more ontologies, more ways of just existing um, outside of, um, I guess, like a, a European-centric way of existence. Um, and through that understanding, you can further see the connections that are there. Um, but it's really difficult to step out of um, that way of thinking, especially when it's um, so trained in us by our culture and society, um, by our uh, education system that doesn't teach on these things. So um, it, 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 it would take a lot of effort. But um, effort that should be done nonetheless. Um, thank you. If anyone has any thoughts on that, like Sarah said, like feel free to drop in the chat or um, uh, come up. I will yes, say please. thank you. That was, that was very, that was very good. That would, that would lead us on the right path. Uh, my name is Chris and uh, I appreciate that. Uh, we'll get started on that and see if we can, we can lead them down to a different path, you know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Um, we come back to um, Vanessa, you had a question um, a bit further up. Do you want to come up and ask it yourself? Yes, I, I will. Um, I'm being a little quiet because I'm actually technically at work right now and not supposed to be watching this, but let me just do it anyways. Um, do you think that instances of hair and its representation like this and feel in and follow um, are cause for us to look at hair in antiquity uh, through different eyes, perhaps, um, especially through maybe a Black ecological lens? Um, for those who don't know, uh, Black ecologies are sort of looking at um, environmentalism and environmental impact and the impacts on nature and how those relate to uh, Black and Indigenous cultures as well. Um, and yeah, I saw there was uh, someone, oh, Jennifer Moss had also uh, mentioned the uh, Bernini's Daphne and uh, Proserpina as well too, which are very like entrenched in a uh, woman as nature sort of narratives from myths. So I was wondering uh, if you have more thoughts about uh, just sort of hair, nature, blackness, and um, how we can sort of take these lenses and reapply them to looking back at antiquity. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that question. Um, I must admit, I 
have not thought so much about um, hair um, as in, in antiquity, uh, but this is a very interesting question. I do um, agree with you that I, I think there um, are connections um, between how um, African hair was perceived um, in the modern world and um, how we can um, use that to change how we perceive hair in the ancient world. Um, because uh, again, I, I'm, I'm not super um, involved, engaged in this work, um, no much, and it's really interesting, but um, based on um, the uh, research epistemologies that we're working on now, it can be assumed that um, this understanding of hair does not always transfer over into um, research on ancient um, women in particular and their hair. So I think um, that a broader understanding of um, how hair is treated um, would be grateful, it would be good. Um, I, I hope that was <laughs> helpful. Thank you, no, it was. Um, next. Uh... Um, Hannah, do you want to ask your question? Oh, sure. Uh, thank you very much. This was a beautiful um, exploration. And um, th this was not my question, but I can tack on to it. It would be great to know more about how we can find Alison Sarr's work, if you have any recommendations um, about finding these images and, and work that has been written on it. But my question was, because um, you talked about Rita Dove and Gwendolyn Brooks, and I'm wondering uh, for you, do you do you see that these are her primary interlocutors? Is this the is she, is she explicit about the fact that this is what she's drawing upon and saying? I mean, basically, my question is: Is she being explicit about uh, black classicism as her inspiration rather than quote unquote classicism, which is just <laughs> to some degree distinct? But you know, you know what I mean? Yes, um, yes. Um, about um, you know what 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 uh, what does she say her influences are? Um, and she, it was, um, a lot of these sculptures were created and um, are created at the time of um, these literary contemporaries. Um, as far as um, her conversation with them, I am not entirely sure. There isn't a lot of work that bridges the gap between um, artistic representations of classics and literary representations of classics, especially among um, Black creators, especially among Black women. Um, so all of my sources have been on the literary side um, and Allison doesn't mention um, in, in, the, in the interviews that I um, looked at, she doesn't mention explicitly um, Rita Dove and Gwendolyn Brooks, um, but she does mention um, pulling from um, stories that black women um, traditionally tell. So I think um, more work or more um, more eyes on this that we could probably uncover there, there are, um, Black women out there who um, or do um, engage with literary Black classicism. Um, Thank you very much. Oh, and as far as uh, far as where you can find uh, these, that is <laughs> um, another um, issue that I'm working through for my project is that you sometimes can't find these uh, because they're um, hidden in um, closed archives. So uh, that's another thing that obscures um, the connection between um, like, uh, like black classicism and classicism or uh, black epistemologies and classical epistemologies is you just have this, um, you, the public can't access it. Um, but a lot of her work um, is still traveling the United States. She's still active, um, is still um, in museums. Uh, and uh, L.A. Lerv, uh, is uh, where she um, is where she currently um, has residency, I believe. Um, there, um, but it does take a lot of um, hunting around for um, art, in particular art that um, combines uh, black um, thought and classical thought. Thank you. Um, yep, and Jody Valentine's also dropped a link for some star works at Pomona College in the chat. Um, Jennifer, um, do you want to ask your question or should I read it? Oh, I need your screen. Yeah. 
Um, I guess I'll ask it. It's actually something I kind of thought about too. So Jennifer's question um, is those roots also bring to mind, um, also bring to mind Bernini's Daphne. So perhaps a statement on rape or bondage. Um, yeah, uh, actually the question, yeah. When I thought about like Apollo and Daphne as well, um, the idea of, I guess like not movement. Um, yeah, I, would you have something? Uh, about the Paolo Daphne um, story, mm -hmm. um, and, I do um, see. And Bernini as well, as mentioned by Jeff, Jennifer. Yeah, I, I do see um, elements of there. Like um, I'm getting uh, wonderful feedback uh, from the audience about um, this this deep connection um, with uh, femininity and um, ecology and nature. So um, I do think um, that does um, come out. I'm sorry, could you could you repeat that? Oh, oh, sorry, but Daphne and I'm sorry, I, I lost track of the myth. I'm sorry, Daphne and Apollo. Um, um, with with that, um, I the, I think in tree souls that comes out more because they are they're stiff and they're they're turning. It looks like they they could be um, turning in into trees. Um, but with uh, the the four statues of Felin and Apollo depicting um, black women in, in the seasons. Um, um, uh, um, Alison Sarr has um, said explicitly that this is um, a borrowing um, of the Persephone myth and it's supposed to um, fall in lines um, or supposed to, to follow at least uh, uh, the structure of that myth no more. Yep, that makes sense. Um, I guess it relates like what you said before about not overriding um, what Sarr herself said about the work. Um, do we have any other questions? From anyone, any questions, thoughts? If not, um, yep, happy to round off here at an hour. Um, I just want to say thank you on behalf of um, the Christian Gold Society, on everyone, on behalf of everyone who attended. To Sierra um, for was a really powerful, insightful, um, and overall just a great presentation. So thank you very much. Um, thank you all for having me, and thank you um, to everyone who attended and gave feedback. And um, I don't know, it was just it was nice to share with you all. I, I really appreciate it being here. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, and yeah, tune in for the last two talks of our. Classics Reconnected seminar series. Um, those will be um, this time next week and then the week after. Yeah. Thanks very much, everyone, for coming and um, have a good rest of your day, evening, wherever you are. Thanks very much.